a lot of the bullying that starts and happens within school, cyberbullying part, a lot of it starts from the everyday bullying that goes on in school. Girls are typically more vicious. Um, they are underhanded. They are more sneaky. Um, many times this can start in third grade for girls. We get quite a bit of complaints from school teachers from third grade girls. The next biggest step is usually the seventh and eighth grade girls are, are typically one of the roughest. Girls usually argue over boys, jealousy, and rumor. Those three main things are the ones that girls absolutely will do anything and everything that they can do to get at another girl if they feel that they are being violated. Sometimes they do it for retaliation. Sometimes they do it for that peer inclusion because maybe they'll fit into another group. Maybe they're doing it because it's that powerful feeling. It makes them feel good about it. The boys, boys still do the physical, the pushing, the hitting, the shoving. Um, they do a lot of it directly in the face and, you know, face to face and then they're kind of done with it. But there's also another group of boys, another group of boys that think it's funny to pick and make fun of people with different sexual orientations. Um, they think that many times they have the right because if somebody dresses that way or acts that way, you know, don't come around me and who do you think you are and you deserve it. And, you know, I try to talk to them about that. I don't care what the sexual preference or sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your religion is. It doesn't matter if you have a stutter. It doesn't matter if you have a disability. Every single person has the right to be able to go into school, to walk down the street, to not be retaliated and harassed for their choices. We don't like change in this world. We don't like anything that's different. We're comfortable in our own skin and our own group that's around us. Anybody that stands to the left of that group that we're comfortable with, all of a sudden they're the weirdos, they're the freaks. Boys think that it's funny to consider, con continually call kids gay, fag, homo, queer. They usually pick on the boys that they know are not going to fight back to them. And they don't see anything wrong with this. Even though the fact is that children who are, have different sexual orientations are bullied quite a bit more, they are also the ones who have a higher uh, rate of suicide because of the constant harassment that they go through. And many times there's such a small group that they feel like that there is no other place to go. No one understands or no one gets them. When a child is being bullied, there are many warning signs. Um, you can see that, one, if these are things that maybe if your child has exhibited before and maybe they start changing that pattern. Maybe you have a child who always loved to go to school and all of a sudden they don't want to go to school. Or they loved riding the bus and they're trying to avoid the bus situation now. Or they come home with torn clothes or missing items. Um, they come home and they are starving before and they said they didn't get a chance to eat lunch and you see that the lunch count money is coming down but they're still starving, something's going on. Their grades start dropping. Um, they start you know, isolating themselves, pulling back, not wanting to hang out with the s same friends or go to that birthday party. These are signs, not every single one sign. Some kids go through things at different times but if you start noticing a difference in your child's behavior, absolutely take the time sit down and talk to them and sometimes it's listening to them and, and hearing what they have to say and maybe there are some things that you can talk through with them. We talk to students also within schools about the bystander role, um, the ones who can be the allies and the upstanders in a school. These are kids who are not the victims and not the bully themselves. It is everybody else that is around that situation that either stands there and mocks it and laughs, eggs it on, the ones that stand there and do absolutely nothing because they're not sure of what they should do, and the ones that kind of do the rubbernecking and walk by and they, they see it going on, but it's not my problem. I'm, I'm not getting involved with that. All of them have a role to play. All of them have the ability. They have the chance to step up in the proper ways. We don't want them jumping in and getting pummeled and, and, and hurt. There are simple steps and simple things that they can do. If it is a safe place, and maybe it's just verbal, they can go up and say, tell somebody if they're strong enough within themselves to be able to say, you know what, knock it off. Stop talking to them like that. You know, simply even say to the person, you know what, just come on, don't, don't worry about what they say. That simple little thing, letting that other person know that another peer, peer sees this, that they actually care, means so much more to students versus it being an adult intervening in it. 
They can also, if they see a kid, I talk to kids about, I don't expect you to run up and down the hall and, you know, wear a badge and I'm the bully police and all of a sudden I'm going to stop everything at the school. I would have never done that in school. But you can do small, tiny things. You can see the kid who is sitting by themselves at lunch, invite them to sit with you at the lunch table. The kid that never gets picked on a team because maybe they're small or not athletically inclined, inviting them. Maybe it is at a football game, you sit next to them or invite them to go to the football game. Or they drop their books in the hallway. You pick them up for them. It's the smallest, littlest things that you can do for someone and you have no clue truly what it could mean. Maybe it's their worst day and they actually feel like somebody sees them, that, that they're not invisible in the hallway, that people do care and it can truly help. Bullying related suicides do exist. Um, boys are four times more likely to take their own lives than the girls are, while girls are more likely to attempt to take their own lives. Cyberbullying is an electronic form of the bullying. The difference with uh, cyberbullying though is, is that now the, the bullies can be anonymous. They don't have to do the face-to-face -face confrontation. They can do it through a computer screen. They can do it through their cell phones. They don't have to see the person's expressions. They don't have to worry about what the others, the peers around them are gonna do or say. And so it's an easy way for them to be able to say what they wanna say, send that mean, hurtful message, pass that picture around, making comments on it, upload a video, they type it, they send it, they close it down, and they go about their, ha their happy life. If we had the ability where you did it face to face, many times these same students would not do this because they do, would not be able to deal with you know, that facial, facial interaction. Maybe seeing that person crying or maybe seeing them hurt or maybe the other peers stepping in and saying, you know, what is your problem? Don't do that. Cyberbullying sometimes can just be for fun. They think it's funny, it's a game. Um, sometimes it can be because they're also going through it themselves. They're going through emotional issues themselves. Sometimes they take it out against other people. Befriending strangers. We talk quite a bit about this, about be not befriending people. Kids today, when they're on Facebook, many times they feel more comfortable to add people if they see that there's mutual friends. So if they have 20 mutual friends and a friend request comes up and they don't know who that person is, they look and they say, well, there's 20 other people, so what's the big deal? And they, they go ahead and click it. I talk to them about anything and everything that they put on the internet. Anything and everything that they post, that they type, that they send is there, regardless of it public or being set to private. It is now can be public information. People can view it and their accounts, their Facebook accounts can be hacked into. Their computers can be hacked into. So anything that you put out there, it is fair game. Sharing passwords. I talked to them about not sharing passwords with your best friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, niece, nephew, cousins. I don't care who it is except for if it's your parent. The reason is you're giving somebody the ability to be able to get behind your profile say and do anything that they want to do acting as you. And then now you have no control over that account. And so many times the kids at school, again, majority is going to follow to the right. They're going to flock with whatever the majority feels. And if that majority feels that the things that you've typed, those rumors that on a Sunday night, it looks like you've been talking about 10 different people and making fun of them and, and personal information that you would know about, you go to school and you say, listen, that wasn't me, I, somebody hacked into my account, I can't get back in there, I would never say that about you. Do you really believe that the majority of those kids are gonna believe you? Absolutely not. They might say, you know what, maybe somebody did hack into that account, but you told them, you, you had this information on there, how could they have known? And so again, do not give anybody that ability, nothing is that important for your friends to need your password or your boyfriends or girlfriends. Broadcasting personal information. Students still believe in the face-to-face. -face. They still, if I ask them, if I walked in today and I brought a 50-year-old man, a 50-year-old woman, don't know them, but they're dressed very nice, they have a, a, a good profession, um, they seem very pleasant, but I'm gonna ask them to walk up and down the aisles of the presentation today and take your name, your phone number, your address, and what you're gonna do on Friday night. Will you guys give it to them? And they're grossed out. They're like, that's disgusting, no way. And it's gross, they're creepers, they're old, they're, you know, of course, kids think anybody that's over 20 is agent. And I, I said, why though? I mean, 
you guys put the same thing out on Facebook or, you know, you say where I'm going, I'm going to go here tonight, I'm going to go do this tonight, we're going to meet at the mall, we're going to the roller skating rink, we're going to go ice skating, we're going to do this, do that. They put the location or they put what time that they're going to go have pizza afterwards. You guys are giving people the exact directions, the exact location of where you're at. If so, that 50-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 80-year-old man or woman comes and follows you to a football game, now follows you to the movie theater afterwards, what are you going to do? You're going to panic. It is a scary situation and you need to pay attention to those things that you put out there. Sexting, another issue that's going on in middle schools and high schools. Sexting is when you take a nude picture, or nude or partially nude, 17 and under, it's considered child pornography. When you take that picture, you're manufacturing child pornography. You send it to somebody, you are distributing child pornography, they receive it on their phone, they're in possession of child pornography. If you are 18 years or older and you have a picture of a 17 year old or younger on your phone that is nude or partially nude, you are an adult in most states holding and possessing child pornography. There have been many kids, mostly boys, who have been convicted or been charged with this. In some states, depending on how, even if you are a juvenile, depending on how the courts look at it, if it is a felony under the juvenile code in some states, that sex offender registry will stick with you and that charge stays with you for the rest of your life, even if you're 14 years old. Do not be that person. Do not have that on your, your record for the rest of your life. It is going to be impossible. They do not let sex offenders in colleges. They do not let sex offenders teach in educational systems, work for the government. It is going to be extremely hard to find a normal, everyday paying job if you are targeted and you are charged with this. Girls many times feel the pressure of sending these pictures because the boys tell them that they love them that the boys, you know, they're beautiful. They would never share it with anybody else. It's okay, it's just my private picture. Sometimes girls are fearful that that boy's gonna go like somebody else. So what they will do is go ahead and send the picture. Once that boy gets that picture, sure enough, maybe he doesn't send it to the whole entire school. Maybe he shows a couple of his friends, you know, shows them. He sets his phone down, he goes and does something for a few minutes, that other boy now picks it up, hurries up and forwards it to his phone. Now he can send it on to 10 people, those 10 people can send it on to 30 people and then 200 and 1,000 and 10,000 people. Once you send that picture, you click it. You cannot get it back. You have no control of that photo. And boys are sending photos of themselves to girls. Many times this is happening in middle school and high school. You both need to understand as boys and girls. You both use retaliation against one another. So next week when you're not together and one of you breaks up and hurts the other's feelings, now they have that picture that they can threaten and say, listen, I'm gonna send it to somebody else. I'm gonna send it to your mom. I'm gonna send it to the school. Do not do something that you have no control over because not only legally, but your reputation is something that is hard to get back once it's kind of been implanted in kids in school. Sex torsion is now when these pictures land in the hands of sexual predators. Sexual predators or even anybody online that can hack into your computer, that can look and see and turn on your webcam. They can get in, hack into your Facebook account and see if you have any um, racy pictures. They can hack into your account and then also now turn your webcam on so that they can take pictures of you throughout the day. Once they have that information, now they can tell you and threaten you and extort you and say, listen, you know what, if you don't send me more racy photos, more videos, I'm gonna send this out to everybody on Facebook that's your friend. I'm gonna send it out to everybody that's on your email. There have been numerous, numerous charges of boys and men who have been charged with this, who have broken into the accounts, who have done these same typical things. Suicide, again, is a third leading cause of death for kids 15 to 24. There is about one every 15 minutes in the United States, which is about 90 total during the day. Suicide is a word that we as adults do not like talking about. It's scary. It's petrifying. We sometimes think that if we talk about it, maybe we're implanting that in the kids' heads. Truly, children today are exposed with so many different things. They are aware of this. They hear stories. There have been documented records of children as young as five years old taking their own lives. There has definitely been, um, you hear it in the national news about kids who are nine and 10 and 11 years old who are taking their own lives. We have to talk about this topic. We have to be able to let them know that you are the trusted adult that they can go to. 
you want to make sure that if they are talking about things, if they are all of a sudden talking about it, they're writing about it, they're giving away their prized possessions, it's something to take serious. Don't ever, ever think that a child who is saying, I want to kill myself or I want to hurt myself is just trying to seek that attention. They're trying to get their way. Maybe mom or dad wouldn't let them have the keys for the car this weekend and now they're going to threaten us again. And you think, you know what, you cried wolf ten times before. I'm not playing these games again. I'm not dealing with it. I understand it's hard to determine are they kind of trying to manipulate you or are they truly feeling this way. Here's the thing, you never ever ever take that as are they manipulating you. They are reaching out, but there's a reason that they are reaching out, and it certainly is something that you want to get looked at by a professional and get evaluated in the proper way. The teenage brain. Um, we started looking at this, and we have the president of the foundation as a psychologist and graduated from Pepperdine University and has a lot of knowledge um, with the teenage brain and why it reacts in certain ways. And I was really curious with our foundation of why are kids doing some of the things that they're doing? Many times we as parents or, or teachers have said, you know, to these kids, what are you thinking? You know, do you have a brain? What, you know, I thought I taught you better. I mean, that's something that I've, I've even said to my daughter, you know, come on, I thought you, I taught you better than that. You know better than that. What is, what is wrong with you? And so the National Institute of Health um, project studied over 100 uh, young people um, as they grew up during the 1990s. What they show is that our brains undergo a massive reorganization between our 12th and 25th years that the brain is developed almost to 90% of its capacity by the time a child is and are six years old. They say that they act that way because their brains aren't done, that teens' brains are actually, a, a pro, they're in progress, they're still growing. Um, teens may understand the risky behaviors and the consequences that maybe unprotected sex and drugs and these types of things carry, but honestly, sometimes that risk, that peer risk with their friends is worth more than t and worrying about the consequences. Impulsivity, impulsivity generally drops throughout life, starts at around the age of 10, but truly peaks at around the age of 15. Lawrence Steinberg, a developmental psychologist specializing in adolescence, um, shows that peer relations are not a sideshow to kids. They are the main show for kids. That during that time that they are in that school, that honestly, that peers mean so much more to them. There is no other point in time in their life that peers will mean as much as they do during those school years. Some brain uh, scans study and start over. You ready? Go ahead. OK. So some brain scan studies, in fact, suggest that our brains react to peer exclusion much as they respond to threats of physical health or food supply. At a neural level, they perceive social rejection as a threat to their existence. So sometimes when you have that 15-year-old that is hysterical because the boyfriend broke up with them or the girlfriend didn't get invited to the party or they think that their life is over to them at that period of time, it truly feels that way. They literally feel like no one gets them. Life is absolutely over with. But again, it's because of the development of their brain. It's the way that they're able to take things in. The things that we can do um, to try to change this, we're not going to ever stop bullying 100%. We're not going to ever stop cyberbullying 100%. There are many things that we can do. One is we want to make sure that we can cultivate a positive school climate. We know that if from the top through to the bottom, and we're talking about from the school board to the superintendent to the administrators, down to teachers, down to school staff and aides, and I'm talking about janitors, I'm talking about electricians that are in the school, school bus drivers, Anybody that is going to interact with children during the school day must be trained properly and must be on the same page to be able to start showing that overall school climate. Once children feel that a school and that climate is going to not accept or tolerate these things and that they are going to have places and, pl and plans in place to be able to deal and assess these situations, children have a much better attachment to school versus ones that are, are, are completely combobbled all over the place. That, you know, one school district has this policy and the next school principal doesn't have the same philosophy. philosophy. And so we know that this has to be something to cultivate a positive school climate. These are tips for educators, but also tips for parents. If you want to get involved with your child to understand, be involved. You don't want to be that helicopter parent. You don't want to be that parent that is, it is my way or the highway. You don't want to be the parent that is their best friend. And you don't want to be the parent that's non-existent. Try to be that involved parent. Okay. Try to be that involved parent. 
So one, understand what technology you're giving your children. Understand the cell phone. Does it have picture messaging? Does it have internet service on it? Understand if they have a Facebook, what are the social networking sites that they have? Get the passwords. If you have younger children, start early. Start getting house rules set down. Sit there with your children and talk about what the rules are, what technology you're giving them, how they work. Post those rules up next to the computer on the refrigerator once you come up with them. That we will have 20 minutes in the evening, you will be able to have free time on the computer to play games. And once you come up with all that, if you post it, it is going to be much easier to maintain it versus it being thrown in a junk drawer and out of sight, out of mind. Make sure that you understand that once you give these things to your children, you have to be truly understanding that if you give it to them and give it free reign, they're going to think that it is absolutely their birthright, not a privilege. You have to make sure that you're consistently setting up that if you say no, you cannot have a cell phone and sleep with it at night, it has to be left in the living room charged, you have to stick with that because if they get it in their bedroom, you're, you're, you've lost a lot of the rest of it. So I'm hoping that some of this helps. We have many more tips. Um, you can certainly go to the Megan Meyer Foundation. It's www.meganmeyerfoundation.org. There's tips for parents. There's tips for educators. Um, there's stuff for students on there. And we travel across the country to speak to anybody, small youth groups, to huge um, you know, professional organizations. So I thank you very much for your time, and I hope it helped.